Ora. 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 The uh, President has received the following letter from Senator Seward. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice that today I propose to move that, in the opinion of the Senate, the following is a matter of urgency. The need to act to close the gap to achieve health quality for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders within a generation. Yours sincerely, Senator Rachel Seward, Australian Green Senator for Western Australia. Is the proposal supported? The proposal is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly. Senator, Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr. Pre uh, Deputy President. I'm putting the urgency today to the Senate that, in the opinion of the Senate, the following is a matter of urgency. The need to act to close the gap to achieve health equality for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders within a generation. Tomorrow is, in fact, National Close the Gap Day, a day where Australians across the nation will come together at a range of events and forums to show their support for closing the 17-year life expectancy gap between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and other Australians. They are calling for all Australian governments to take action to achieve health equality for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders within 25 years through increasing the annual Indigenous health funding by $450 million to enable equal access for Aboriginal people to health services, to increasing Indigenous control and participation in the delivery of health services, and to addressing critical social issues such as housing, education and self-determination which contribute to the Indigenous health crisis. The gap in life expectancy and health outcomes between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians is an international embarrassment. We are the only first world country that has failed to make progress on the health and life expectancy of our first peoples. In fact, most developing or so-called third world nations have made better progress with population health despite the chronic hardships they face. On average, a person from Bangladesh, for example, can now expect to live for 10 years longer than an Indigenous Australian. As our Social Justice Commissioner Tom Carmer pointed out at the release of his 2006 Social Justice Report, the fact that a wealthy country like Australia cannot fix a health crisis that affects only 3 per cent of our citizens is simply not credible. The greatest threat to Indigenous Australians is disease, and many of these diseases they face are easily preventable and have long since been eradicated from our non-Indigenous population. Australia has the dubious distinction of being the only developed country that has not yet eradicated trachoma. Other First World nations have, within the last decade or two, managed to significantly reduce the gap for their First Peoples. Canada, New Zealand and the US have all reduced their life expectancy gaps down to between five to eight years, as opposed to our outrageous 17 years. And infant mortality rates for Indigenous Australians are now almost twice as high as those in New Zealand and the US. Indigenous babies in Australia are two and a half times, two and a half times more likely to die before the age of one than their non-Indigenous counterparts. And if they are in the NT or WA, then they are three times more likely. They are also twice as likely to have low birth weight, which places additional stress on their development and makes them more vulnerable to the poor health in later life. The WA Aboriginal Child Health Survey reported very high rates of reoccurring ear infections, reoccurring chest infections, reoccurring skin infections and reoccurring gastrointestinal infection in Aboriginal kids in the West a comprehensive study that is likely to reflect similarly high rates across um, a comprehensive study would we believe likely to reflect similar high rates across the country recent re research into the rates of ear infections in the NT carried out by the Menzies School of Health research showed that 80 to 90% of aboriginal children have persistent ear infections within the first 3 years of their lives hearing hearing problems as a result are of easily prevented and treated ear infections especially Otis Media, 
are a major factor in poor educational outcomes for Aboriginal kids who simply can't hear or understand what the teacher is saying. Now let me touch for a brief minute on the Northern Territory intervention, which the government, I have no doubt, will come in here and argue that it's their contribution to closing the gap. Well, let's have a look at some of the, some of the material that came out just today. Today we had a leaked briefing from the Aboriginal Medical Service Alliance of the NT on crikey that suggests that the medical checks are failing to reach more, more than 10 per cent of the at-risk population. They claim that the health check component of the intervention is largely incompetent, probably unethical, underfunded and absolutely ignores the long term. They claim that they are in breach of the National Health and Medical Research Guidelines, Medicare Guidelines and the Health Screening Guidelines issued by the, Australian, sorry, the Royal Australian College of General Practice. It is estimated that, as a consequence of the lack of experience and training of the medical task force in Aboriginal child health, they have a misdiagnosis rate of about 50 per cent below known disease and illness rates. And the rate of diagnosis of ear infections is a whopping 77 per cent below that would be expected on the basis of expert research. Diagnosis of otitis media, middle ear infections where kids have fluid behind their eardrums and hence experience significant hearing loss is particularly difficult, especially if you are not experienced with working with young children, let alone with Aboriginal children. However, if you are going into communities where there are known to be high rates of this disease, surely you would ensure that you knew what you were looking for and would be, and would be taking along the right equipment. However, this latest report from the NT found that only 10 per cent of children referred to the ENT surgeon um, that, that referred to the surgeon that it has in fact not been done. The level of hype around the NT intervention raises some serious ethical issues because of the manner in which it is raising false expectations within the community without having in place the resources to follow it up. This is hype, it is not actually dealing with the issue. So, can you please remember those facts when you hear the government come in here to argue that they are doing something about closing the gap because we've got this wonderful medical task force in the NT? Well, now we're starting to hear on the ground what's really happening. A recent report by the World Health Organisation found that the health of Aboriginal Australians is lagging a century behind the rest of the population. P sorry, per capita access to primary health care remains 40 per cent of that enjoyed by other Australians. Half of the Aboriginal population over the age of 15 already show signs of chronic disease, despite the fact that they are three times as sick as other Australians. Their access to primary health care, as measured by the Medical Benefits Scheme and the, and the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme, is only 40 per cent of the general population. That is, despite claims by the government that they are spending a large amount of money on Indigenous health, for every one dollar spent through the PBS and, M and, and MBS on a non-Aboriginal Australian, only 40 per cent, only 40 cents is spent on an Aboriginal Australian. The work done by Access Economics for the AMA estimates that an additional $460 million per year is needed simply to bridge the existing gap between the health needs of Indigenous Australians and the current spending. I seek leave at this point to table a report by Nacho and Oxfam titled Close the Gap Solutions to Indigenous um, Health Crisis Facing Australia. I have, in fact, um, contacted all WHIPs about this and I understand that um, leave has been granted. The Australian Greens believe that this report is provides— Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator the Australian Seward. Greens believe this report provides us with a strong basis on which to proceed. I commend this report to the Chamber and urge all parties to take on board its recommendations that relate to access to primary health care, the number of health practitioners working within the, within the Aboriginal Health Service, responsiveness of mainstream services, greater targeting of maternal and child health, increased funding and support, and setting, actually, actually setting national targets and benchmarks towards achieving healthy health equity for Aboriginal Australians. The AMA put out a very good report in May that provided a long list of successful Indigenous health programs. We recently helped co-host an exhibition of photos in Parliament House by Oxfam, which doc documented some of the successes in Aboriginal health. The big point, that the positive outcomes from all the, the big point is that the positive outcomes of these successful initiatives point to the fact that this is not an intractable problem. It is not a case of, case of not knowing what to do, but simply a matter of scale. The reach of these programs and the level of resources and infrastructure behind them is simply inadequate given the extent of the problem and the levels of chronic illness that need to be tackled. We, what we need is a commitment, pure and simple, 
to better primary health care on the basis of need. More resources that tackle the issues are essential. We need to put more effort into tackling the social determinants of poor health as well so that we can reduce the level of chronic disease and the massive demands that chronically ill people place in our medical health system. We need to tackle this through prevention, through healthier living, through better homes, through better environments in which people live in, and also ensure that people have a sense of control over their lives. We need to set ourselves clear targets, targets that we can measure and be accountable for our progress against. And that's why I also believe that the report and the recommendations put forward by Tom Karma, our Social Justice Commissioner, are essential in helping us meet the target of closing the 17-year age gap in life expectancy between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians. Close the gap is absolutely essential within the next generation. People aren't saying this can be done overnight. What's being said is we need to do it within a generation and there's a clear plan for doing that. We urge, urge, beg, in fact, the government to target the resources that are needed to address these issues. As I said, we know we can do these successful programs. There are successful programs on the ground. What we need is a commitment to start addressing them properly and not taking the funding away from groups Order. when Senator work Seward, isn't done. Thank you for your contribution. Senator Conference. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, as uh, one of the uh, uh, co-sponsors of the uh, Close the Gap exhibition that was held recently, uh, showing uh, the positive outcomes that have been achieved uh, in, recent, uh, in recent years. I was, um, I'm very pleased to take part in this debate and to um, indicate that although um, I appreciate and, and share with Senator Seawitt an understanding of the enormity of the task facing us as a community, uh, I don't for one instant um, want to downplay um, the extent of progress uh, in this area and the way in which, uh, as Australians, we have I think in a very real way in recent years come to grapple with this issue in a much more tangible and a much more effective way than has been the case in the past. And I will spend some time in my remarks today um, talking about um, the progress that has been made in dealing with the significant disadvantage of Aboriginal Australians with respect to health. The first thing to put on the record, of course, is that the challenge in closing the gap between uh, the standards of health uh, of Aboriginal Australians and other Australians is uh, a truly enormous one. Health outcomes for uh, Aboriginal Australians uh, are frankly unacceptable. They are far behind those of other Australians uh, and it remains a major national challenge to close uh, the difference between those two sets of statistics. For example, um, in 2003, babies born to Indigenous women on average uh, weighed 219 grams less than those born to non-Indigenous women. Babies born to Indigenous women were more than twice as likely to be of low birth weight, less than two and a half kilos, uh, than were those born to non-Indigenous women. Uh, indigenous uh, babies are more likely to die in their first year than non-Indigenous babies. For example, in 2002 to 2004, the infant mortality rate for Indigenous babies was highest in the Northern Territory. Uh, 15 babies died out of 1,000 births, and in Western Australia, 14 died out of 1,000 births. Uh, the rate for uh, the total Australian population is only five deaths per 1,000 births. And it's possible to quote a very large number of areas where those sorts of depressing statistics uh, are replicated uh, in areas like cardiovascular disease, um, in the incidence of cancer, uh, in uh, the incidence of diabetes. Um, and chronic kidney disease and so forth. Um, and uh, it won't be difficult for anyone in this debate to quote a great, at great length such statistics which are being very carefully compiled by a variety of um, health bodies uh, in this country. Um, Australia needs to confront uh, those statistics with great uh, energy and commitment, uh, with the same kind of energy and commitment that would behove any major uh, national challenge with these dimensions. Our response has to be well informed, of course, by the life experience uh, of Aboriginal people uh, and the cultural environment in which those uh, people live. Um, we must accept, of course, that the answers to these problems will be extremely expensive. Uh, we must also accept uh, that the solutions go beyond simply putting in place uh, a variety of services which are either not there at the moment or are there at grossly inadequate levels. Um, we must act uh, in 
knowledge of the background uh, of the failings uh, of um, existing services, a background which is very complex and needs to be well understood. Issues like uh, the remote locations where many Indigenous Australians live, the lack of suitable uh, infrastructure for other social services like housing and education, uh, which are very much part of the total picture uh, with respect to Indigenous Australians, the low literacy levels that Australians, Indigenous Australians experience, the lack of a pattern uh, over several generations of interaction with health services, and lifestyle issues uh, such as high levels of alcohol and substance abuse. Most importantly, of course, uh, in examining uh, the solutions to these problems, we have to accept that there have been many generations of dispossession and disadvantage, which has damaged severely the capacity of Aboriginal families to address endemic health problems in their communities. But can I say, Mr Acting Deputy President, it is vital for an informed and a fair debate on this subject that we present a balanced view uh, of, of the health issues facing Indigenous Australians and an approach uh, which emphasises only uh, the distance that we as a nation have yet to go and does not note uh, and record the progress that we have made on these subjects uh, runs the risk uh, of persuading many people that the problem is indeed insoluble because the endless trotting out of these statistics uh, about uh, uh, poor results in Aboriginal health uh, will tend to lead people to the conclusion that we simply can't win. We can sustain better outcomes, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, and indeed the truth is that we have done just that in a number of key areas in recent years. Senator Seawitt said that um, uh, we are making no progress, and I think that that with great respect is untrue. The uh, available information uh, about uh, health outcomes for Indigenous people, while still uh, far from acceptable, does point to some real progress in a number of key areas. Um, uh, the all-cause uh, Indigenous mortality rate, for example, in the Northern Territory, South Australia and Western Australia, where so, such a large proportion of our Indigenous community lives, has decreased, decreased by 16 per cent since 1991 and 2003. I mentioned the uh, Indigenous infant mortality rate, again an unacceptably high rate of infant mortality, but that same rate has declined by 44 per cent um, over that period 1991 to 2003. And with great respect to, um, to suggest that because uh, that rate of um, um, uh, infant mortality, or I think it was in fact the that the life expectancy of, of Indigenous Australians was lower than it was for people in Bangladesh, with great respect, does not establish the proposition that we are therefore not making any progress against um, that benchmark. Uh, in fact, we are improving the position um, of many Indigenous people, and in many respects we're able to point to ways in which all Aboriginal people have had better outcomes in a variety of areas. Death caused by circulatory disease declined at a faster rate for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people than for other Australians, and the gap between outcomes for them and for the rest of us have narrowed. New figures from the Menzies School of Health Research shows a marked improvement in the life expectancy of Indigenous people born in the Northern Territory. The report released uh, in April compares figures from the 1960s with data collected in 2004. And that study shows uh, some very interesting things with respect to uh, the life expectancy in the Northern Territory of men and women. Uh, the life expectancy of women in that period, of, of men in that period, I should say, has increased by eight years, from 52 years of age to 60 years of age. Now, I don't accept, I don't, I don't de uh, deny for one instant that 60 years of age compared with other Australians is still completely unacceptable. But it is real progress. It is real progress, and we should note that in a balanced debate about these issues. The increase in life expectancy of women, uh, Indigenous women in the Northern Territory, has increased even more dramatically, uh, from um, 54 years to 68 years. Now, that is important to note in a debate like this. Mr. Acting Deputy President, um, part of the reason for that has been a very substantial additional investment. 
uh, particularly in the last few years, by the Australian government. In fact, um, there has been a real increase on spending uh, on Indigenous health of 210 per cent uh, since the 1996-97 financial year. At that time, we were spending uh, federally $110 million uh, on Indigenous health. Today, we're spending $440 million each year on Indigenous health. But I might say that even that benchmark um, is being uh, greatly overshadowed by very significant new announcements with respect to, um, to health spending in this area. New funding uh, was announced in the most recent budget of $112.5 million over four years for three new measures to increase Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's access to primary health care, to improve child and maternal health outcomes and to improve the quality of Indigenous health services through accreditation mechanisms and support. In the last four budgets, um, other processes such as uh, uh, the budget itself and COAG and the Intergovernmental Summit on Violence and Child Abuse in Indigenous Communities has committed over $470 million to improve Indigenous Australians' health. Those are real benchmarks of progress. And although I accept that inputs are not the same as outcomes, it's very important that when we talk about these things, we look at the ways in which um, these issues have changed over the last few years. It is not true to say, Senator Seward, that we are going backwards. It is not true to say that we're making no Order. progress. Order. Thank you, Senator Humphreys. Senator Moore. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. The debate this afternoon is a positive one, and I think it's one that we can share. When Oxfam and the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation, which is a daunting title, um, released a discussion paper which Senator Seaward has sought to have tabled this afternoon in April 2007, earlier this year, um, the front page, I think, is one that we can look together and see a benchmark from which we can move forward. Apart from the stunningly beautiful photograph, and Oxfam are renowned for their ability to get the message across in photographs, which I think tells people's stories sometimes much better than no matter how effectively we can debate in this place. But apart from the stunningly beautiful photograph from Mornington Island in Queensland, there is a statement from Professor Mick Dodson, which I will quote, and I'm sure people will continue to do this, but it's one that I live with because I think it's one that we can hold on to as we continue to debate. And I quote, the statistics of infant and perinatal mortality are our babies and children who die in our arms. The statistics of shortened life expectancy are our mothers and fathers, uncles, aunties and elders who live diminished lives and die before their gifts of knowledge and experience are passed on. We die silently under these statistics. Now that quote is an important one for us to hear, but it's not negative. It's actually a statement that gives us the challenge which we are expected to take forward. The Close the Gap campaign, which has been so effective across our country in engaging people in the community in effectively considering what are the issues that are facing Aboriginal and Islander people in our community. That campaign looks at our history because, as Senator Humphreys has said, you cannot just make a simplistic statement about what should happen. What we should do is understand the complexities of what has happened. And it is an important year to do that because we have the opportunity now of looking at the, the consideration of the impact of 40 years since the referendum actually gave Indigenous people the right to vote in this country. Um, secondly, we can also look at the movement forward of taking a snapshot of what has gone before, facing together the negatives that we have heard, but not being overwhelmed by those negatives. If we do that, we won't move forward. The statistics are there, and as, as Professor Dodson said, the statistics that roll clearly off people's tongues about um, the life expectancy of people, the unacceptable uh, infant mortality and also just the, the way of life of so many people in our community, those statistics roll off the tongue and uh, we can have inordinate debates, as we've done with the Productivity Commission, which is a huge volume of statistics, most of which are negative. But what we can do is learn from them. We have the ability to learn from those stats. And one of the really effective things about the Close the Gap campaign is what has been done has there has been research of processes that have worked. 
and we can learn from those. It's not just extra funding. There must be greater funding, and Senator Humphries has pointed out the growth in funding over the last couple of years, but it's not enough by itself. When you have Mick Dodson's words in your mind, when we hear what those stats mean to Indigenous people, they are their families, they are the people that mean most to them. You just can't quote statistics. What you have to do is concentrate on what can be done to address the problems. The problems are known. We've had these debates in this place before. The issues that Senator Seward has outlined, we know there have been so many reports that have been tabled in this place that have been tabled as far as the United Nations, talking about issues of disadvantage for Indigenous populations, not just in Australia. And that's come out in the recent debates about the International Declaration of Indigenous Peoples. The issues that are being uh, confronting Indigenous peoples are not peculiar to our country. But what we have to address is that the issues for Indigenous people in our country have been bad. They, we have an opportunity, this generation, to put in place steps forward that, as the Close the Gap campaign is asking us to do, within a generation, a time frame of 25 years, and most of us would be, I think, positively thinking, Mr Act Deputy President, that we'd be around for those 25 years, so that at the end of that time we'll be able to take another snapshot and be able to objectively assess whether the things that have been put in place in 2007 effectively, objectively and cooperatively, whether those issues that have been put in place, what advances have been made. So that at the end of that 25 years, which is the process around the Oxfam Close the Gap claim, we will be able to see whether the issues of mortality rates, whether the issues of longevity, whether the issues of education, whether the issues of housing, all those that we know about, what advances have been made. And it is our hope and it is our challenge that we will be able to say in 25 years' time, these plans have worked. Maybe we will not have solved all the problems, and in fact there has never been any act which has solved all the problems. But in fact, in 25 years' time, the people who were sitting in this place at that time should be able to say that in 2007, the arrangements that were agreed cooperatively, as the Oxfam report says, amongst all levels of government, engaging all the people who are citizens of this country, those measures have made a genuine difference, because that's what the challenge is, to make a difference. Rather than concentrating on the past and what hasn't worked, acknowledging the past, not pretending that it didn't happen because way too often people become too defensive and they try and come up with excuses about what happened, about how much money was spent, about where it could have been misspent, concentrating on those things instead of doing what Oxfam has asked us to do, to look at workforce, to look at improved access to education, to look at culturally appropriate primary health care, to acknowledge what is happening now with the knowledge that we have, because the Product Productivity Commission report of two years ago, I think, left us in no doubt about what the state of our nation is now. There is no grey in this area. We have the statistics that have, been, that have been gathered and will need to be continued to be gathered. But when we're looking at those stats, at those numbers, when we're groping to come up with ways to ensure that the um, life expectancy is improved, when we're looking at ensuring that maternal and, and child health statistics are improved, I think it does us um, good service to continue to have a look, as Professor Dodson said, to see the people who are those statistics. Somehow it makes it a stronger argument when you're looking at those issues as being people and being family members. One of the encouraging things about the whole discussion around Close the Gap has been the way that there has been community engagement. And things like the photographic exhibition, which Senator Humphreys referred to in his contribution, I think um, has a really valuable role to play in ensuring that we see what does work. And no one who's been able to have a look at that photographic expectation and see those glorious positive photographs of people who are part of our community now and be able to see what is going to be 
in 25 years, if we go back down and have photographs of those same families to ensure that they are still here and to be able to map the wonderful little boy who's on the front of Closing the Gap to see where he is in 25 years' time, because that is the challenge. There is an understanding that the work that we're doing, the focused funding, the funding that is not linked to punishment, because my concern about what's happening at the moment in the Northern Territory is that any value that is being achieved by the influx of medical help by the influx of people involved in the process is linked to a sense of punishment. And that is not the expectation of close the gap. It is not people coming in from outside working on the community. We are well beyond that. And the expectation of close the gap is working with community to achieve outcomes. When that can be achieved, then the, uh, the people who gather together and say that we are um, part of a, a wider Australia, that all the expectations that any one of us can have should be available to everyone, and in particular in this campaign for Aboriginal and Islander people, no matter where they live. Because one of the things that I think that is most um, damning over the last couple of months is there seems to have been a focus almost exclusively on the Northern Territory. Close the Gap is not a campaign for people who live in the Northern Territory. Close the Gap is a campaign for Aboriginal and Islander people across the whole country, no matter where they live. And that's a challenge for us. And for Mr Acting Deputy President, I think in terms of positives, I think if we can hold on to the work that's being achieved at the moment by the Mums and Babies program in Townsville, that is exactly the kind of program that does work. It has been celebrated in Close the Gap. I think if we can work together in that way, in 25 years' time, we'll be able to show success and not continued concern about the challenges that we've missed. Thank you, Senator, Senator Allison. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I'm asked to join this debate uh, and welcome um, Senator Seward's motion and the um, Oxfam Closing the Gap report. But I just want to talk about two things. Um, on Wednesday last week, uh, several parliamentarians went to a dinner which was put on by Vision Australia, I think was the name. And one of the presenters at that dinner was a Dr. K uh, Katrina Roper from the Department of Health and Community Services in the Northern Territory. And she's part of the National Trachoma Surveillance Unit in the NT. And she talked about the, the impact on Aboriginal communities of trachoma. Now, I remind um, honourable senators here today that trachoma doesn't exist in any other developed country around the world. Um, but it does in very large numbers in our Aboriginal communities. And the most shocking aspect of, uh, of this is that it can be treated and it can be treated relatively easily. There's an antibiotic which, if administered in, uh, in, in good time, that is when children get it, and they do all the time, uh, when children get trachoma, um, uh, the bacteria, uh, an anti. Um, um, uh, uh, what did I call it? <laughs> antibiotic, thank you. An antibiotic uh, can solve the problem. And for just $22 million, we could eliminate through, the, through every Aboriginal community the incidence of trachoma. Now, I, I remind um, the Senate that trachoma uh, makes people blind in the end, that the, uh, the eyelid becomes so deformed it turns inward and uh, the action of the eye eventually destroys the eyeball so that this is a hugely debilitating condition. Um, and it's hard to believe that in this day and age, when we know that there, there is a way of, um, of curing this problem, uh, as I say, it can't be cured if you don't get it, in, get it early, uh, but we know that there's a way forward on this issue, but we're not even taking that minimal step of providing antibiotics to those um, at risk. Uh, it, can be, it can be administered as a preventive measure, and it has the added benefit of uh, clearing up a whole lot of other infections as well within Aboriginal communities. Um, the, other, the other that I often cite, a condition which is, also, which is almost as debilitating, is scabies. And again, it's a condition which occurs in no other developed country around the world, but it affects every Aboriginal community. Uh, I go into schools when we travel around as a, as a committee usually and ask what the incidence of uh, scabies is in schools, and very often the answer is 80 per cent. Now, uh, what, what, the, what it means to have scabies is a mite that gets under the skin and is so itchy that you want to tear your flesh off, 
Uh, what, what happens over time with scabies is that it affects all the major organs in the body, and it is a major factor in why it is that uh, Aboriginal people don't live as long as non-Indigenous people. And it too can be fixed. Uh, there is a simple ointment that can be applied to people who have scabies. Uh, in one wonderful school that we went to uh, some time ago at Elko Island, I asked this question of the principal and he said, we, ha we only have about 5 per cent scabies. Uh, and the kids were very bright and shiny and black hair and black skin, looked fantastic. Uh, and he said, they hold it at bay by closing the school down every term for one day and with the clinic, they go into people's homes, they, uh, they administer the ointment, they clean up um, dogs, they, uh, they assist communities generally to, uh, to keep scabies uh, away. And this is utterly crucial. If we want children to learn in schools, then they've got to be free of scabies. And it's appalling that 80 per cent of them are not in so many communities. Uh, now, we all know that, uh, that if there was better housing, if there was uh, better sanitation, if kids washed their faces and their eyes so that they were less likely to get trachoma, uh, if there were better jobs, if there was a better environment in many of these places, better nutrition, uh, all of those, uh, and better health services generally, then our Aboriginal community would not have such an appalling health record and uh, shorter life expectancy. But um, those two examples that I've, I've given could be done without fixing all those things. Now, I'm not saying they shouldn't be fixed, but they are possible to do, and it is disgraceful that this government, after 10 years, has not done so. And I might say the government before it, because governments have neglected Aboriginal health. This is not something that's happened since 1996. It's been, uh, it's been an appalling record that governments in this country have overseen. Uh, they pay lip service to doing better in Aboriginal communities, but even the simple solutions to some of these debilitating problems are not adopted. Order. Thank you, Senator Arison. Senator Patterson. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. I don't think anybody in this uh, Senate would deny that there is more to do to improve Indigenous health and to reduce the difference in life expectancy between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. But closing the gap won't be achieved by primary health intervention alone. There are a raft of other policies which impact on the health of our first Australians. But let me just remind people about uh, the appalling record that we inherited from the Labor government in 1996, when we had 53 per cent of all of our children only vaccinated. Now, that was an appalling situation, down around third world countries' levels of vaccination. And it wasn't uh, just white Australians, but Indigenous Australians, and I'd bet, if I were a betting woman, that the Indigenous Australians' record would, would, be, would have been higher, in terms, lower, sorry, in terms of, of coverage of, in, of vaccination. I didn't have time to find that figure. But through an innovative social policy, not a health policy, through an innovative social policy, Michael Wooldridge um, brought around an increase in, in vaccination to over, a rate of over 90 per cent. And there's been very little measles infection in Australia, and children were dying of me from measles before that. Uh, and uh, that measles infection has decreased in both the Indigenous and the general population. And the successful control of, of measles and other vaccine-preventable diseases such as diphtheria, polio, rubella and tetanus underlined the successful importance of universal vaccination programs for Indigenous health. And in addition, we had a program for, before we were able to vaccinate all children against pneumococcal disease, we had Indigenous young people, thank you, Indigenous young people um, being vaccinated against pneumococcal disease because they were most at risk. Measure after measure indicates an improvement in Indigenous health since the change of federal government in 1996. In the four years 2000 to 2004, which is the most recent figures we've got, full-time estimated doctor, doctors employed by Aboriginal and Torres Strait health care services rose by 50 per cent. Senator Moore was talking about about uh, workforce. Full-time estimated nurses, there was a 53 per cent increase in that four-year period. And the number of Indigenous health care workers increased by 19 per cent. And I would predict that uh, we'll see sem similar increases uh, in, the next four, in that four years, 2004 to, to 2008. Well, another measure that uh, Mr Waldridge brought in, uh, Dr Waldridge brought in, was a rural clinical schools program, the University Schools of Rural Health. It takes a long time for those to have an effect. And that will be one of his lasting legacies. One of the lasting legacies of the, of the Howard government will be that now young people, young Indigenous people, are being trained in Broome or Wagga or Turalgan 
and they uh, spend more time in their own communities, more time practicing their skills in, in remote communities. That would never have happened without that innovation of those rural clinical schools programs and the University Schools of Rural Health. Between 1999 and 2005, the proportion of ATSI primary health care services providing specific programs increased. And I'll give you some figures. Antenatal maternal programs went from 58 per cent to 70 per cent of services. Women's health programs from 73 per cent to 87 per cent of services. Men's health programs 55 per cent to 74 per cent of services. And eye screening 57 to 70 per cent of services. And uh, specifically targeted maternal and child health programs have produced declines in preterm uh, pre births from 16.7 per cent to 8.7 per cent, which is now comparable with the general population, and a decrease in infant mortality. Now, Senator Moore mentioned the Townsville uh, Mums and Bubs program. I went up to visit that when I was health minister, and uh, they were running it on a shoestring out of a garage, uh, part of the, as they jokingly call it, the Taj Mahal, the Townsville and Aboriginal Highlander, Islander Health Service. And uh, they said to me, "Can you fund this minister?" Well, really, it's a responsibility of the Queensland government. It was an infant welfare program, but you know what happens now? It's funded through the Commonwealth because. We managed to uh, in, in, in increase the funding to the Townsville, uh, the, uh, Townsville Indigenous Health Service. So that program go. You go in there and you see these babies who are thriving, absolutely thriving. The mums feel confident about their parenting and the children are thriving. A perfect example, but really something that the state should have done something about. Now, in, uh, the Aboriginal people have had increased access to the PBS and to the MBS, and there have been specific uh, health checks have been introduced for uh, children and for adults, and the recent Northern Territory emergency response will have a significant impact on the health of Indigenous people, in, and in particular in children. Now, it will also have an impact on health in the fact that we will have more police presence. One of the things that nurses say, and I think Senator Adams will probably speak about this, is that they're subjected to terrible violence when they go out. There might be a, a, a nurse in, a, in an indigenous, remote indigenous community, and they're subjected to violence. That discourages and dissuades nurses from being there, and then would have a negative impact on health. So to have the states coming up to the plate, and Western Australia, as Senator Moore said, that we've only focused on Northern Territory because that's where we've got the power to intervene. The Northern Territory should be looking at more police to reduce that threat to nurses. As I said, primary health intervention is not the only way to impact on Indigenous health. Uh, there are other policies that, which have a positive impact on health. Uh, if you look at uh, the No Pool, No School program in Indigenous communities, school attendance goes up, ear infections and scabies, which uh, Senator Allison didn't have time to mention, scabies has an enormous impact on the health of adults. Uh, as children grow up and they become adults, they have kidney disease as a result of it. Pool has an effect on that. What happened in what air? We had a pool. We had a no school, no pool program. The kids turn up to school. There aren't enough seats for them, not enough teachers for them. If that had happened in South Auburn, or happened in Dandenong, or happened in, in uh, Lilyfield, or somewhere else in Sydney, or somewhere in Melbourne, there would have been an outcry. But no, the Northern Territory government gets away with it because they haven't got enough places, not enough teachers to actually uh, look after those children when they turn up. Another example of a non uh, an indirect uh, effect of a policy which isn't a, as, isn't a primary care policy. Senator, you'll have your chance in a moment. Cape York Financial Information Management Program has seen school attendance go up, an educational outcome, has seen domestic violence go down, a social and health outcome, and better nutrition, a health outcome. And the recently announced community um, stores pr uh, uh, policy by Minister Bruff which relates to the operation of community stores in the Northern Territory, although, again, not a direct health intervention, will no doubt have an impact on health. And uh, What we're doing is setting up a licensing system for community stores in the Northern Territory. Stores that are licensed will be able to participate in the income management arrangements. Licenses will be issued to community stores that are able to participate in the requirements of the income management scheme, have a reasonable quality, quantity and range of groceries and consumer items, including healthy food and drink, available and promoted at the store, and can demonstrate sound financial structures, retail practices and governance. Now, I've been to remote communities, both in my two roles as uh, Minister for Health and Minister for Family and Community Services, and it's quite interesting to see the significant differences. Some stores are managed well, and some of them managed by Indigenous people, who really have got a, a motive to manage them well, managed in, in the sense that they actually run cooking classes, 
They prepare meals for people to come and take away. They actually prepare school meals for the children and they're prepaid. And what you see in those communities is a significant change in their health. Other measures that need to be taken into account, and you see considerable differences across Order. communities. Thank you, Senator. Um, Senator Crossan. Yes, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, I rise uh, this afternoon to actually speak on this uh, matter of public importance uh, as well. Uh, those in this place will remember, prior to the APEC summit in Sydney, the Anderson Wild Report, of course, uh, titled Little Children Are Sacred, commissioned by the Northern Territory Government, was widely reported on the uh, national media. We all know now, of course, that uh, that report was uh, as, a, as an instigation of the uh, Northern Territory uh, Government into the situation with children in Indigenous uh, communities. <clears throat> I think it's fair to say that since APEC, Indigenous issues have uh, fallen off the national media's radar. However, Indigenous issues are, as always, of critical importance to not only myself but uh, the Labor Party. Uh, not a year goes by in this job where we don't see some sort of report into uh, the gap between uh, Indigenous health outcomes and life expectancy and those of non-Indigenous people. We get it from the Australian Medical Association when they hand down their report card. We get it from uh, national Aboriginal community health controlled organisations and in the Northern Territory we have some of the most outstanding Aboriginal community controlled organisations that you will actually come across in this country. And now, of course, we have the report from uh, Oxfam. The situation of our Indigenous peoples continues to be, to be extremely dire. Uh, NACHO, which is the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation and Oxfam Australia, uh, have launched a report uh, called Close the Gap. It's a policy briefing paper uh, and, of course, it states that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders continue to die nearly 20 years younger than non-Indigenous Australians. Uh, and I would have to say, from a personal point of view, in the last couple of months, I've attended a number of uh, funerals for Indigenous people uh, who have died between the ages of 37 and 53 from diseases which would normally strike down non-Indigenous people who are at least 20 years older than, than those Indigenous people. So the, the facts are there and the, uh, the real-life experiences are there for us to, uh, to witness and participate in. While Indigenous health issues have been problematic for many nations across the globe other than Australia, we seem to have the greatest difficulty in combating these problems, with the same Close the Gap paper I mentioned before stating that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander infant mortality is three times the rate of non-Indigenous Australians and more than 50 per cent higher than for Indigenous children in the USA and New Zealand. So this chamber is no stranger to such horrifying statistics. I and many other senators have raised many similar statistics in other speeches in this chamber time after time and year after year. In fact, I think it was my colleague Minister Scullion from the Northern Territory who said in this chamber more than five years ago when reflecting on poor Indigenous life expectancy figures, uh, he pointed out, and this is a quote from his speech, that average life expectancy for Indigenous men is less than uh, mine, that is Minister Scullion's current age. So what has Minister Scullion and this government done with an extra five years of their life? Perhaps that's a question that only that minister can answer. But all I have seen is a fundamental failure to show leadership on addressing Aboriginal life expectancy and a complete inability to work collaboratively with the Northern Territory Government to achieve any of the necessary outcomes. Australian Labor Party, on the other hand, we have recently released uh, in the lead up to this election a policy paper called New Directions, an equal start in life for Indigenous uh, children, where we have outlined, as the alternative government, our policy commitment to helping Indigenous children as a way to make the greatest difference over the long term for Indigenous communities. The policy paper quite clearly articulates our position on this issue. We believe that life expectancy gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians remains one of the starkest indicators of inequality in the Australian society. The Howard government has now had 11 long, very long years 
to try and minimise this gap. The Labor has a plan, though, to focus on the critical years from birth to eight years of age, particularly in terms of support to child and maternal services, early development and parenting support, as well as literacy and numeracy support in the early years. Our plan represents a total investment of $261.4 million over four years, comprising of $186.4 million in Commonwealth expenditure, supported by $75 million from the states and territories. Speaking of the states and territories, we've seen, particularly over the last few months, that this Howard government is more interested in blaming the Northern Territory government and riding roughshod over it instead of working collaboratively. Federal Labor recognises the important role that the Martin Labor government in the Northern Territory is playing in addressing Indigenous disadvantage in the Northern Territory. Uh, and I think it's about time that somebody in this House actually recognised the significant resource commitments that the Northern Territory government's allocated for ad addressing Indigenous disadvantage and to publicly recognise the work that public servants, nurses, health workers and those people uh, employed by the Northern Territory Department of Health have actually undertaken over their uh, working life in uh, turning around uh, these statistics. I have to say, as I get around Indigenous communities in the previous uh, couple of weeks uh, in relation to the Northern Territory's uh, intervention on behalf of this government, Northern Territory public servants are actually saying to me they feel that their work has been worthless over the last couple of years and decades with uh, this intervention, and there has been no recognition of the substantial work that those public servants have played uh, in trying to uh, reduce this gap, particularly in, uh, in health services. Uh, the Northern Territory government has committed $286 uh, million over five years to implement a closing the gap strategy. This funding package means that there will be 223 real positions created to help close the gap. This is a generational plan of action and it should be applauded. And it is to the great disgrace of the opposition in the Northern Territory that they refer to take cheap political shots at the Northern Territory government rather than working with them collaboratively on this. Uh, instead, this government has uh, demonstrated that it prefers to sit on its hands instead of taking real action in closing the gap. We have a federal government that really prefers to play politics instead of showing real leadership working collaboratively with the states and territory governments and putting the money on the table that will actually go towards assisting closing this gap we are debating today. The Australian Labor Party uh, has, as I have discussed, demonstrated its commitment to closing the gap. We agree with Nacho and Oxfam that poor Indigenous health is affected by social and economic factors. Diseases triggered by poverty, overcrowded housing, poor sanitation, lack of access to education, poor access to medical care for ac acute diagnosis and treatment, and poor nutrition. These factors are all preventable living conditions and, if addressed, can have real health implications for Indigenous people. Uh, and I can't let this opportunity go by in my remaining few minutes to actually mention the word trachoma. I know that Senator Lynn Allison uh, mentioned it because, of course, we were both uh, last week at uh, a dinner for the uh, Parliamentary Friends of, uh, of Vision, uh, where uh, Vision 2020, in conjunction with a number of other uh, health experts in the uh, eye area, uh, actually spoke at a dinner last week. <coughs> I think perhaps it might have been the first time that Senator Allison had actually been alerted to the dire situation we have in this country in relation to trachoma. I've been pursuing it now for many, many years, and I know that people in Oatsi, and in particular uh, one senior public servant, will know that uh, this has been a passion of mine for probably the best part of six or seven years now. But trachoma is a disease of poverty. It was eliminated from white Australia 100 years ago, and it's a disease that we know how to handle. It exists in Aboriginal communities. The fact that it does exist is a national shame. We are the only developed country in the world that has trachoma, and without some concerted effort, we may end up being the last country in the world. Countries such as Morocco and Iran have already eliminated blinding tr trachoma, and this year, in one of the most backward of all African countries, Nigeria, six and a half million people will receive treatment for this disease. 
Some Aboriginal communities have rates of trachoma that are amongst the highest recorded anywhere else in this world. The Howard government has just paid lip service to interventions on trachoma and has not made any significant commitment or change. $900,000 to develop a policy and to train health workers and to set up a national database may well be a good start, but they need to fund the medicine Order. that goes into the eyes of Thank these you. people. Thank you, Senator Crossland. Thank you for your contribution. Senator Adams. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy. Uh, President, well, I rise uh, this afternoon to um, speak on something that's very close to my heart. Being probably one of the only nurses in the parliament, um, I was very fortunate to attend a conference at Broken Hill, which was um, the uh, Council of Remote Area Nurses of Australia. They came from all over Australia. There were 125 of them, plus a number of allied health people, and all the things that we've heard from those opposite these nurses are actually tackling, and guess what? The Howard government actually supports the organisation. These were the people that, when the uh, Northern Territory invention, uh, um, intervention um, uh, program was to be brought together, health professionals were a very, very important part of that. This was the organisation that the government went to. And they were very, very careful in the way that they asked the, asked the um, government teams to approach um, the issue. There was to be no big stick approach, as we've heard from the other side, that this was the intention. It certainly was not. These people have done the most wonderful job with briefing the um, health teams that are going through the Territory. And um, as I was saying, they, um, it's their 25th year, um, so it was their Silver Jubilee um, meeting. And on top of their agenda was finding solutions to the health issues impacting on remote communities and the health workforce crisis gripping Australia. It was the most wonderful conference, and um, some I could go on um, probably all afternoon talking about the different um, presentations that were made. But it's important to note that nurses and midwives are safe providers of primary health care, already living and working in most communities, no matter how small or isolated. The remote area nurses provide a model of care that needs to be acknowledged, and I'm sure it is acknowledged by the Howard government. Kriana believes that this model can be part of the solution for the health care crisis in Australia. And I will go on about um, some of the key areas that were identified, but I think it's very important to um, know that the Australian government co-sponsored this conference and uh, recognises the important role Krana has in supporting the remote health workforce across Australia. They put $25,000 towards the funding of the conference. And they also um, fund the Krana Secretariat to enable Krana to manage their programs, as well as engaging with stakeholders at all levels to develop policies, protocols and initiatives that improve and support remote nurse nursing practice. There's $881,000 over three years for this. They provide the Bush Crisis Line, which is a 24-hour free call telephone service staffed by qualified psychologists that provides crisis debriefing and counselling for job-related trauma to isolated remote health practitioners and their families. And I note that one of their recommendations is that by July 2008, no nurse should be left to practise in isolation single nursing posts must be abolished. And I certainly agree with that with some of the stories that they have come up with. Um, a health research education officer who coordinates and teaches in the remote health practice program at the Centre of Remote Health provides mentoring and clinical supervision and assessment of the uh, remote area nursing students and provides academic leadership and resources to Krana. And uh, there was a very good um, presentation by Vicky Gordon and Sabina Knight, and these were the two people that were asked to coordinate the um, health, child health uh, check teams and um, brief them on what to expect and how to go about their role as they move through the um, 73 communities in the um, Northern Territory. And something that was very, very important and I would like to um, see improve or extended as the first line emergency care, the FLEC program, which aims to increase the access of people living in remote areas to high quality emergency care through a program of upskilling of remote practitioners. If these practitioners are not upskilled, they will not stay there. So it's very, very important that this program, 
which includes the remote emergency care and the maternity emergency care program, is delivered by volunteer trainers. And these trainers come from a number of our intensive care areas, right through. They're all, um, most of them are state employed um, professionals, but they are there as volunteers to focus on the multidisciplinary advanced emergency and trauma management skills. This program at the moment is given 590,000 over three years, but it really does need to be doubled. The facilitators are brilliant, and it's got to the stage now that defence and mining are asking that this, these particular teams can be, adapt their programs to go and help them as well. So this is recognition of what the Howard government has done in uh, providing this sort of um, money and support over the three years, but it really, as I said, does need to be increased. And they also have an Indigenous program which aims to upskill health professionals that service the Aboriginal community controlled health services and emergency care. This includes the production of culturally appropriate teaching resources and stimulation material. So uh, with the Prime Minister's announcement of enrolled um, nurses now being able to be trained in um, hospital settings, I do see that this for Aboriginal health workers would be a great way for them to become enrolled nurses and have the support and backing of working actually in a hospital environment rather than for them trying to sit in a lecture theatre. This is not the way they learn. They learn by experience and by hands-on. So I think that the Prime Minister's announcement there for enrolled nurses to go back to the hospital-based training is um, very, very good, and I, I really do support that program. So um, just to move on, I think that it's important that um, the uh, comment made uh, by Christopher Cliff, the president of, Cl of Krana, after this great weekend says, let's mobilise and utilise nurses, the most trusted and abundant of our health professionals. Remote area nurses already provide a high level of service in some of the sickest and most advantaged, disadvantaged people in Australia. With the shortage of doctors, their role is even more important. The nursing and midwifery profession isn't running from the daunting challenges. In fact, they are eager to address it head on. I plead with the federal, state and territory governments Order. to make this call from nurses and midwives Order. and enable Order. them to tackle the increasing needs of remote and rural, rural communities across I Australia. I apologise, Senator Adams. The time uh, allocated for this uh, debate has expired. But thank you for your contribution. The question is that the motion moved by Senator C would be agreed to. Those in favour, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Madam Clerk. Ah. We now move on to committee reports. Um, what about Minister? Senator Weber. Mr Acting Deputy President, I draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Uh, quorum not present. Ring the bells.